of sin. And uh, what a great song that is. Psalm 37 is where we're going to be today. I'm going to grab this other mic pole. Psalm 37, we're going to be in a few places in Psalm and other places in the Bible today. But I want to talk to you today. Well, let's just say it's a pre-summertime message. Wouldn't you agree that summertime's a little struggle for the Christian? Would you agree with that? Uh, schedules change. Kids are out of school. The weather gets a little warmer which that entails other things. And it's just a struggle for the Christian to stay right. Summertime is a slippery slope. It's a slippery time. And uh, so today, we're just going to kind of talk about in that kind of area, I want to challenge you, just kind of charge us, all of us, to make sure that we're just doing what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. Amen. And uh, Psalm 37 Verse number 23 and 24. When you find that, let's all stand. We're just going to read these two verses. We'll read them all together, both together. Psalm 37, verse 23 and 24. Very familiar uh, verses to many of you. And let's read them together. Ready? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall... He shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I want to talk to you. I want to use that word steps there, and I want to talk to you about this subject today. Watch your steps. Watch your steps. And uh, let's pray. Father, we love you today. We're thankful for what you're going to do today already. Thank you for what you've already done uh, in the song service. And uh, what a blessing these songs have been about the uh, tying in the stars and the stripes with the scars and the stripes of your body and the blood that you shed. And when I think of Memorial Day, I think of the blood that soldiers have shed uh, to keep us free and tie that in with the blood you shed to make us free. And uh, what a wonderful truth that is. And uh, Lord, it is all about the cross. And today, may we lift up the cross today. May we lift you up and draw all men unto you. Father, hide me behind your cross so that you may be seen today instead of me, so you may be heard instead of me. Your spirit may be felt instead of mine. So, Lord, we need to hear from you today. Please bless our service. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Summertime can be a time, an easy time to let things slip. Schedules change. Kids out of school. Again, I've already said that. Vacation season. Season. And as Paul, we must walk circumspectly. You say, that's just a big word. Well, it simply means to walk diligently and with a purpose, straightforward. Watching our steps so that we will not be utterly, as it says here, he will not be utterly cast down. David, the author of this psalm, has had to learn this very valuable truth of watching his steps, just like all of us do. In fact, he is writing this psalm as, a, as he's an older man, a more experienced man than he used to be. And some, something about age gives us a little bit of experience. Look at verse 25. David writes, I have been young, now I'm old. <laughs> Very clear, he's not a young man anymore. He's learned and gained some experience, an experience of life. And not every experience comes with wisdom, but it does lead to that if we choose to take God's wisdom and to get that. David has learned some things about life and from the steps he had taken. He had learned that uh, it does absolutely no good, listen here, kind of tie it in with Sunday night, or last uh, Sunday night, to worry about bad people doing bad things. Why does a child of God worry about that? Look at verse number one as we go back up and just kind of look and see where he's leading here. Fret not, that means don't worry. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, those who are bad people. Evil means doing something bad to someone else. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So don't worry about people, bad people doing bad things. That's just going to happen. That's kind of our world. All right, we live in. He says, don't worry about that. He says, here's why you don't worry. Look at verse 2. 
In other words, I've got them. I've got it taken care of. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Okay, God's going to take care of that, right? Look at verse number 9. For evildoers shall be cut off. All right, there's their, there's their reward. Okay, so we don't have to worry about it. Fret not because of that. Look at verse 10. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Why are we worried about it then? Look at verse number 13. The Lord shall laugh at him. Uh-oh. That's not a good laugh. Having the Lord laugh at you is not good at all. Verse number 14. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Isn't that sometimes the world we live in? Some of you who work with uh, the secular world, I, 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 I feel for you because you have to put up with a bunch of stuff. And rub elbows with the unrighteous and listen to their conversation. And they like to slay you of your upright conversation. They like to mock you. Almost like what the man told us here, Brother Whiteside, about that him doing to that girl as before he got saved. Look at verse 15. They may they may cast out the bow, they may draw out the bows and bend their bend their or draw out the sword and bend their bow, but look what happens to their sword and bows. Their sword shall enter into their own heart. And their bow shall be broken. Again, God's going to take care of it. Why are we worried about it? Right? That's what that psalm right there is talking about. But then God says, instead of worrying, look at verse number three. He said, here's a good formula. Why worry when you can trust? You say, it's supposed to be pray. I know, I just coined a new one. Why worry when you can trust, right? What does he say in verse number three? Trust in the Lord. And he says, and, and, and not just trust in him, while you're trusting him, do good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And you'll find out when you truly trust God, you will do good. He'll make all things good because you're not leaning on your own understanding, right? You're trusting in him in all your heart and all your ways. So shall they dwell in the land and barely shall be fed. He's going to take care of that when those who trust him. He says, not only worry, but uh, trust. He said, not only worry. How about number four? Verse four, delight yourself. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of, your, of thine heart. Do you delight yourself in the things of God? That will get rid of worrying about those things. Just, just, just enjoy singing God's songs. Enjoy reading God's word. Amen. Enjoy going soul winning, knocking on doors, telling people about Jesus. Enjoy your ministries. Delight yourself in the things of God. Amen. Amen. And you'll forget all. You know, the best cure for somebody who worries all the time is go do something for somebody else. Yeah. Amen. It'll work. You'll see, you'll see that, you know, there are some people out there that need, that need that. Commit. Look at verse 5. Commit thy way into the Lord. That'll work. Stop committing our ways to somebody else or something else and commit our ways to the Lord. That'll work. And, uh, and trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. Look at verse 7. Rest in the Lord. Now that doesn't mean what some of y'all are doing right now. I haven't even put you to sleep yet. Don't go to sleep on me yet. Rest in the Lord, except for on Sundays between 1030 and 1130. Amen? Don't rest then. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way. You know, we're always worried about somebody prospering in the way. Don't worry about that. Trust. Rest, get, the, get rest. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices... To pass, And it goes on and on and on. In other words, God says, I'll take care of those bad people and I'll take care of you. In other words, and I'm going to tie it in here, it's as if God is saying, I'm in control, ready, of your steps. I'm in control of your steps. And I want you to turn to a parallel passage we're going to use today in Psalm 85. A psalm that's attributed to the chief musician. A psalm for the sons of Korah. But we see here that God is talking about his people. And really how he desires to bring revival to his people. Look at verse number 6. 
Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? That's the whole purpose of the song. Seeking and desiring revival again. Verse 7, show us thy mercy. And then it gets down to verse number, uh, let's look at verse number 11. Well, let's look at verse 10, I'm sorry. Psalm 85, verse number 10. I want you to underline every time you see the word righteousness, okay? Here we go. Mercy and truth are met together. Here it is. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. I want you to underline that word righteousness. By the word, by the way, by the word, <laughs> by the way, righteousness and peace kissed each other on Calvary. The righteousness of God demanded a pardon. The peace of God that passed all understanding gave you the pardon. Righteousness and peace kissed each other. Verse 11, truth uh, shall spring out of the earth and righteousness, underline that or circle it, shall look down from heaven. By the way, that's where all righteousness is. Verse 12, yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. Reminding us again, don't worry about it. The Lord's going to give that which is good. And our land, here you go, Brian, Mark, farmers, our land shall yield her increase. <laughs> God's going to take care of that. All right? You say, well, I haven't got anything in the ground. God's going to take care of it. But you know, God's going to take care of it. Do we trust? Are we committed to the cause? Are we resting in his promise? All right? Trusting, not leaning, going, okay. That's hard to do, but I'm trying. <laughs> And then look at verse number 13. Righteousness. Three times here in four verses. Righteousness shall go before him. The him there is God. The him there is the Lord. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us. Listen to this. In the way of. We're talking about steps, right? Righteousness sets us in the way of. His steps. Now, I, I pulled these two together to show that three times here, righteousness, his righteousness, that is leading the way to that revival of walking in his steps. Verse number 10 says, God's righteousness leads us there. Verse 11 tells us that God's righteousness is reaching down from heaven where righteousness dwells. In verse 13, righteousness will go before him, that's God's righteousness, and his righteousness shall set us in the way of his steps. I don't know about you, but every time I walk in my steps, I, send, I, I, I tend to fall a little bit easier. It's a little easier to slip. It's a little easier to neglect that which I know I'm supposed to do. I want my steps to be ordered by the Lord. So that when I do fall, by the way, the word fall there in that verse in Psalm 37 doesn't mean fall away from God out of salvation. Because we believe in eternal security, right? It's all through the Bible. Once saved, always saved. No man can pluck you out of the hand of the Father. And so, but when you do fall, the word means to get weary and faint-hearted. Now, you've been there, haven't you? When you're weary and faint-hearted, he says, so that when you fall, which we will, we will not be utterly cast down. That's what Psalm 37 said. In other words, we may be brought down, but we're not out of the race. Amen? We're not out of the race. Because God's got this. He's ordered our steps. He's upholding us with his hand. That's what it says. Now, if he promises this, and he does, and God who cannot lie keeps all of his promises, he's not like your... Like, a, like your typical salesman, right? You buy that car, you buy that vacuum cleaner, you buy that refrigerator. Man, this is guaranteed, you know, with a small writing. God says this is guaranteed with big writing Amen. so everybody can know that it's from me. And if he promises that, why do we then face the problems in life? Isn't that the question you get from the world? Why does God allow this to happen? Why does God take this? Why does God do that? Why all the disappointments and discouragements and pain and suffering and despair? Well, there are many reasons for it, and our ways are not his ways. But I'm going to try to help us today to understand this point right here. 
It is because we have chosen. And by the way, do you realize that's one thing that you own that God allows you to have on your own is your will, your choice. He's allowed that from the garden. Man made the wrong choice, brought sin into the world, right? Death passed upon all men and the curse of sin and its nature is very prevalent. But it's because we have chosen, here's the route I want to go today. It's because we have chosen our own path, taking our own steps, and have not let his righteousness and our right living set us in the way of his righteousness, his steps. It says that the good man, that God orders his steps. This is the one walking in his righteousness because he's a good man. One who isn't walking in his steps, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Let me show you the path that he leads down. Verse 10, Proverbs 1. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they, sinners, say, come with us, sinners, let us, sinners, lay wait for blood, let us, sinners, lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us, sinners, swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We, sinners, shall find all precious substance. We, sinners, shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us, sinners, and let us, sinners, all have one purse. Does that not describe the world? But it also describes the person who is walking, and may I say even a good man, when his steps aren't ordered by the Lord because he's not walking in his righteousness. Are you, are you getting how I'm tying these together? I'm, I'm, I want to make sure you're not confused here. Verse 15, the charge says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them, those sinners. Refrain thy foot, your foot, my foot, from their sinners' path. Their steps are not your steps. Their steps are not his steps. For their feet, look at verse 16. They're sinners, so they run to evil. And they make haste to shed blood. Surely in net, uh, vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily or privately for their own lives. And look at the, what it says here in verse number 20. Wisdom says, watch your steps. Right? That's not what it says here, but that's what I'm saying. That's what wisdom. Wisdom will say, watch where you go, right? Watch where you're, oh, be careful, little feet, where they go. <laughs> oh, be careful, little heart. Oh, be careful, little eyes. Oh, be careful, little ears. Oh, be careful, little hands. Right? The little kid's song applies for us, too. Amen. Why? Because wisdom says, that's not the steps you're supposed to go to. <laughs> and here's where it leads you. Look at verse number 20, well, let's just read it. Wisdom crieth without. Let's just put it in context with steps. Wisdom saying, don't go in that way, right? Walk not in the way in their path, right? She crieth in the chief place. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse and the openings of the gates. In the city, she uttereth her words. She's saying, watch your steps. Here we go. How long, you simple ones? So you got the silly ones still loving to be silly. And the scorners, those critics, oh, they're loving to scorn. And fools, they don't like knowledge. They hate it. And he, God says, and wisdom says, turn you at my reproof, because you're going the wrong way. Steps aren't God's steps. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words. You understand when you turn, that's called repentance. That's what repentance means. It means to turn around, make a change. You're going one way, I'm walking in the wrong steps, aren't I? God says, yes, you are. Turn around. Go back to my steps. Are you with me? Amen. So he says, turn you at my reproof. And then he says, I'll pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you. I'll put you in the right steps. Okay? But then look what he says. Because I have called. And then what do we do? We refuse. I have stretched out my hand. 
I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. I have sat and heard the preaching while I was sleeping. And I'm not saying physically, but mentally sleeping. Sitting there awake and alert, but not getting, not registering. I, I, look at verse 25. You have said it not all my counsel. The counsel of don't go there, don't do that. Don't run with them, don't run with that. You, you, put, that, you put that away. And you would none of my reproof. Now notice what he says in verse 26. Same thing he said in Psalm, didn't he? Yeah. I will laugh? Really? I will laugh at your calamity? You say, isn't that cruel? No, that's the choice you made when you, not, when you chose not to walk his way. You, you made it, right? You made the choice. But that's what happens. He said he will laugh. I don't want to be there. I don't ever want to be there. I've been there before. I've refused God's reproof. I've said it not his counsel. And my steps were slipping faster than I wanted to admit. He says, when your fear cometh, look at this. As desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. Distress. I mean, those aren't good words, folks. Desolation, destruction, distress, anguish. All that comes upon you, right? He said, then they shall call upon me. And these are probably the saddest words in the Bible. But I will not answer. We have got to learn in the Christian life, and I'm not trying to be mean here, I'm just trying to be real, that we cannot walk in our own way without suffering reproof from God. The reproof that when you feel that God doesn't even talk to you anymore, you better check your steps. You better make sure, and, and not just for the preacher's sake. People do that. Well, let me clean up preachers in town. No, why don't you clean up? Jesus is in town. And he's always in town. And he's always watching. The man that I am is uh, the man that I am in private is a man that I am going to be in public. I had a, uh, an opportunity at, at uh, college days. Uh, some pastors were there and they, they asked us to come up and I wasn't ready for that. I didn't know they were going to do this. But they asked us to come up and they said, is this still working? Uh, they asked us to come up and give a word or two or a little whatever uh, about some challenging young preacher boys. And, um, and I said, I just thought, and I, I, I was, aren't you glad you're not first when they do that? <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, man, I wish I would have heard about 13 others, you know, get, get a little bit of momentum going. So I was about in the middle, so I, was, I heard a lot of, other, you know. And, uh, of course, you know, you don't want them to say what you said then either, right? Because then you're like, oh, man, you stole my thunder. But, um Anyway, so I'm up there, and I said, okay, God, what are you going to give me? What are you going to give me? They said, what's the most important thing that I could tell these young preacher-to-be boys? Uh, what can I say? What can I say? Preacher-to-be boys? Preacher boys-to-be. <laughs> preacher boys-to-be. Um, and what can I say to them that would encourage them? That's the most real thing that I could give them, and God gave it to me. And I said this. I said, you are, are your private life dictates your pub, your public life. And I sat down. You know how true that is? Yeah. 